Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? You're probably familiar with how vinyl records and cassettes have seen a major rise in popularity over the last few years. But there are some signs that compact discs may be seeing a bit of a comeback as well. This time, let's check out an easy and inexpensive option for getting into that format. So it's kind of a yucky, rainy day outside, perfect for just hanging out and talking about retro audio hardware. You can tell I've got a decent selection of portable CD players here, and we'll talk about this hardware in a bit. But first, I think it is worth discussing what's going on with the compact disc format and why would you even want to get involved in it at this point in time? I think a lot of it stems from what we've seen with vinyl records and cassettes. Decades ago, those two formats were dominant, and they were really just the way that people listened to music if they wanted on demand, right? Streaming didn't exist back then, MP3s didn't exist back then, we're talking like the 80s, early 90s. Vinyl and cassettes were it, and CDs were up and coming. But by the end of the 90s, CDs had absolutely taken over, and vinyl and cassettes were in major decline to the point where I think most people would agree that during the 2000s, both of those formats were effectively dead. Yes, there were some small indie labels still doing kind of boutique releases on vinyl and tape, but they were very small numbers. None of the major labels were really all that interested in them. The, effectively, the sales were practically none, right? You couldn't really go into any major electronic store and pick up brand new vinyl or tape. CDs, however, well, they declined for sure at the 2000s because of the whole MP3 revolution. But what's different is CDs never really died. And that's what makes what's going on with CDs now so curious in that well, in 2021, CD sales actually went back up. And if you read into the numbers a bit, some people could argue that it was really just because of some major popular releases that came out that year that helped drive CD sales. Though there was also apparently a, a little bit of a bump in sales of older releases, basically older CDs, stuff that had been released a while back that people were deciding to check out on compact disc. With some other inklings going on about CDs making a bit of a comeback and people being optimistic about the format in 2022, I think it makes sense to talk about if you want to get into collecting compact discs. Maybe you're young enough to have never really experienced that format during its heyday, how would you go about doing that? And I think the cheapest, easiest, and least risk way of doing so is to buy a portable CD player. Now, if you own absolutely nothing related to CDs, well, you might be inclined to just go out and pick up a brand new player. That's what a lot of people who are brand new to vinyl and cassettes are doing, is they're just going out to an electronics store or Amazon, other online seller, and picking up a brand new turntable or brand new cassette player. Turntables are kind of a different matter because, well, there are high quality options out there, but if you've been following the cassette scene, you probably know that there are very few what would be considered high quality, even decent quality, cassette players that are being made brand new these days. Sadly, I think that's kind of the same case with compact disc, at least when it comes to actual audio focused players. There are a few boutique or higher end dedicated audio CD players that are home components. So if you were building a big full home stereo, that might be worth looking into. But if you're looking for a more low risk or smaller investment way of getting into compact discs, portable players are definitely the way to go. My recommendation is to skip all of those cheap, no name players that you'll find on Amazon and pick up a used one from a major brand. You can see I've got a whole bunch of Sony players here, and Sony wasn't the only manufacturer back during the 80s and 90s and early 2000s that made good quality players. 
but they were probably the largest manufacturer. And they had a lot of really good features and most importantly, also generally really good sound quality as well. So let's take a look at a few different generations of player and what you can expect not just to pay, but also get in terms of features and impacts on reliability. Now, the very first portable CD player ever made was this one, the Sony D5 slash D50. It had different model numbers based on where you bought it around the world. And I actually did a dedicated episode all about this player if you want to learn more. This one, obviously, because it was the very first one from 1984, it's got very limited features. It's prone to skipping. What's interesting is there's also no ability to put batteries directly in the unit. You either had to get an external battery pack or plug it into AC power. The whole idea behind this player wasn't so much to make it portable in terms of carrying it around and listening to music while you're on the go, but rather make it so you can take it over to other people's houses, plug it into their stereos, and show off how cool the compact disc format was. Throughout the rest of the 80s, there were a number of really interesting portable players that various manufacturers produced, almost all of them Japanese manufacturers. The problem is, just like with vintage cassette Walkmans, vintage CD Walkmans have incredible value these days, really more for collectors than for practical use. Some people swear by the sound of these older players, I think the sound can be a bit more inconsistent between models because during the 80s, manufacturers were spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to miniaturize components. And so you'd get that variability. They hadn't really kind of come to a standard at that point. By no means am I saying that some players sound bad and other players sound good. It's just they'll have slight different tonal characteristics to them. The average listener, you're probably not really going to notice. It's more of an audiophile kind of thing. And personally, I would take some of those recommendations on one player versus another with a grain of salt. If you're looking to get into CDs inexpensively, a player from the 80s isn't going to make the most sense because, well, they can reach hundreds of dollars used just because of their collectability. Admittedly, they do look super cool. They've got quite the aesthetic to them but it might be a bit too much to ask for someone who's looking for a low cost way of figuring out if this format is even for them to begin with. So that gets us into players from the 90s, specifically the early 90s. This is when I think the major manufacturers had started to really kind of standardize on how the players were built and also dramatically reduced their price. These players were the first ones that could be accessible to the average buyer without it being more of an audiophile kind of thing. The early 90s is when CDs really started to take off in the consumer market and people were seriously thinking about leaving cassette tapes behind. This particular player, you can see kind of just, it's still a bit chunky. It's got a metal bottom, but a plastic top. It's got basic controls. There aren't a ton of crazy features on here. It still does have a line out jack. So that suggests, you know, maybe this was your only CD player at the time instead of buying a portable and a home player. And it's got mega bass. So we're starting to see some interesting features getting added in, but this player is still kind of old in some other ways in that the battery compartment is inside and it takes four double A's. That's another major factor that you'll see over time is not only were they able to miniaturize components as time went on, as you'd expect, but the power efficiency of those components got dramatically better. You'd put four double A's in something like this and maybe get five or six hours of runtime based on if you were using good quality batteries or like cheap drugstore ones. Um, you'll also notice that there is no shock protection on this player. So it's not really conducive to like walking down the street or throwing in a backpack and listening to because it would just be skipping all over the place. But these are still built very solidly because there is still some metal components to them. There might be some reliability concerns just because of their age, things like capacitors getting old or grease inside the mechanical components um, like that drive the laser assembly. Um, sometimes that grease can dry out, plastics can crack, that sort of thing. 
a player from the early 90s like this isn't going to cost a ton of money. I mean, you'd probably be in 20 to 30 bucks for something like this, and you can get one that still looks kind of cool, um, but it may require a bit of work to get going again. As you start to progress a little later into the 90s, that's when players start to become very commodified. And you can also see how designs start to get reused. Like these two players, this is a D141 on the left and a D131 on the right. They're practically identical in terms of like their button layouts and where their connections are. This is when Sony and other manufacturers started to really kind of hit limits when it came to commodifying their parts or miniaturizing things. They didn't redesign the entire player every single year when they wanted a new model. They would just kind of tweak the exterior a little bit. Or maybe they would have similar models in the same range and some would just add or remove features compared to others. Brand new, a player like this probably would have cost about a hundred bucks. But because they had gotten the miniaturization thing figured out and the simplification of components, you're much more likely to find a player like this that's working. Uh, just because of the inherent reliability of removing the number of mechanical and electrical parts. The downside is both of these are entirely plastic. Um, so they're not really as satisfying to hold as something like one of these guys where it's a metal base or an all metal player from like the 80s. Um, but the trade-off is power efficiency. Both of these only take two AA batteries and you can use rechargeables with them if you prefer and you can get much better battery life, you know, close to eight, 10 hours out of players like these. And these again are also fairly inexpensive, somewhere in the 20 to $30 range off of eBay. Now at the same time, we started to see some new features getting added to higher end players to help differentiate them and also to help improve profit margins for these manufacturers. Instead of just producing inexpensive players, now they've got a variety of them available at different price points. This one is from probably 94 or so, 95. Uh, this one is the D375. Its major feature is ESP, electronic shock protection. This is the kind of player that you would be able to throw in a backpack or bag or just carry with you while walking down the street and expect to get reliable audio without it skipping. These work by pre-reading data off the disc. The whole key is that the mechanism in players that have shock protection, it's able to read the disc faster than real time. So when you press play, it'll spin the disc up faster than normal, read a bunch of data off of it, and then store that data in a memory buffer. And the memory buffer is what feeds the digital to analog converter for real-time playback. If the player gets shook or bumped or whatever, where the mechanism skips, it loses track of the data on the disk, that buffer buys the mechanism time to figure out where it was, move back into place, and then spin the disk a little faster again to refill the buffer. Here's another player. This one's a D242CK. The CK stands for car kit. And that's another kind of interesting little footnote in the history of portable CD players is that while we started to see actual car stereos in the 90s offer built-in CD players, a lot of people were still driving older cars that only had like cassette decks and they didn't really want to buy a dedicated new stereo for their car. So some manufacturers, Sony included, would sell these so-called car-ready versions. Really the only difference is that they may have included something like a 12-volt power adapter so you didn't need to run it off of batteries, and then one of those like fake cassette adapters. So if you had a tape player, you could plug the adapter into here to get audio output, and then it just pretends to be a cassette that the car stereo can play back in quotation marks. Otherwise, they're pretty much the same. They could absolutely be used as normal players. And that's kind of the point is, again, you know, instead of having to buy multiple CD players, well, maybe sell a car kit version and then this can be your only player, whether you're driving in the car or walking down the street. The big catch with players like these and basically any player that has electronic shock protection, and this is something that I learned only relatively recently, is... <sighs> 
you've got to pay attention to the details of how each player is set up with that shock protection if audio quality is really, really important to you. What I learned is that, well, in the 90s, memory, like specifically RAM, as in what would be in your computer, was fairly expensive still. And obviously some amount of memory or RAM needs to be in these players for that shock protection to work. And based on how much RAM a manufacturer decided to include would dictate not just how long of an anti-skip buffer you could get, but also the amount of audio compression that had to be used to reach that target. And basically, if you have shock protection turned on with a lot of these players, because there's only so much RAM in, in order to meet a price target for these players, they would have to do lossy audio compression in order to fit all that data in memory for an appropriate amount of time. This one says it's got 10 seconds worth of ESP. This one, I believe, is closer to three or four seconds. The main difference probably just came down to how much it would have cost Sony to put an appropriate amount of RAM in one of these players for that anti-skip feature. Now, because that's lossy audio compression, some people can tell. A lot of people can't tell the difference. And personally, I think both of these players sound perfectly fine. But if you're more on the audiophile side of things, finding a player with shock protection that you can turn off, like this one has a button where you can turn off ESP, same thing with this particular player. If you can turn off ESP, in most cases, that will bypass that memory buffer and the chip will not do any lossy audio compression. It'll just pass the audio straight through from the laser into the DAC with no loss of quality. That's not necessarily something that you'll see with later players, however. These, in terms of pricing now, as used devices, honestly go for about the same as a player that doesn't have shock protection. So unless you can do specific research about a model that you're interested in, if audio quality is super important and you don't plan on carrying it around with you, it might be safest just to buy one of these players that doesn't have shock protection at all. Otherwise, you need to do your homework to make sure that the player you're interested in has the ability to turn it off and that when it's turned off, it still doesn't engage in audio compression for whatever reason. This particular player also is kind of interesting in that it's got one other neat feature. Besides shock protection, it's got an optical digital audio out jack on the side. And this would have been perfect for pairing with something like a portable mini disc recorder, or if you, for whatever reason, wanted to use this player with a high-end stereo that had optical audio in. It basically bypasses the digital to analog converter inside this player so you can offload that to a separate device. 99% of people who even bothered to use the optical audio out did so so that they could copy CDs over to mini discs. And that gets us into the later part of the 90s and three of these players I've actually got kind of a direct relationship with. This was from, I believe, 96 or 97. This player is from 1998, and then both of these are from 1999. This player is the D151, and it's actually the very first Sony branded player that I ever bought. This isn't that specific one. That one, I think, ended up getting sold at a garage sale or something a while ago, but I picked another one up on eBay recently. This thing cost me, I think, like 15 bucks to buy another one of. Um, brand new, it would have cost about 100 and it took me a while as a kid in 1996 or so to save up a bunch of allowance money to buy this, but it replaced a previous player that I had that was much lesser quality. No bells and whistles on this one, no shock protection or optical audio output or anything like that. Just a very simple but reliable player. I always liked the sound quality out of this one, and I think this is a good model to look for if you're wanting something that's going to be more reliable, no bells and whistles, but still easy and inexpensive to get into. 
This is the player that I upgraded to from the other one. So this is model DE401, and the main reason why I went to it was for ESP. This was my first player with shock protection, and this is the actual player that I bought back in 1998. I'd like to say I bought it at Sears, back when Sears was even a thing. Um, Groove was an interesting kind of experiment on Sony's part. It's like the next evolution of Mega Bass. What's interesting is that it's got a little bit more of an EQ curve to it than just the bass. It brightens up the high end a little bit too, and I actually like what it does to the sound. I've always enjoyed having a little bit more of a fun sound signature to music instead of more analytical. But you can, of course, step it through different levels of bass boost and just turn it off entirely if you want. Likewise, you can also turn off the shock protection on this player, though it does work really well and by my recollection, it doesn't really impact sound very much. Beyond those two features, there really isn't a whole lot else like interesting or unique about this player. It does offer support for the inline remote control, which was an optional accessory. I never got that with this player. With some portable players, that inline remote was just buttons. And the idea was you could leave the player in a bag or a pocket or a purse and then clip the remote to your shirt and then your headphones get plugged into the remote. And if you want to change the volume or skip track or whatever, you can do that without having to, you know, fish this out of whatever it's in. Sometimes those were included with the players, other times they weren't. This one didn't include it. Like a lot of the other kind of mid 90s players that advanced into using just a pair of AA batteries. And I remember getting excellent battery life out of this thing with a pair of alkalines easily a dozen hours or more. So here's another, I guess, recommended model if you're looking for something that maybe could be a bit more portable and still not too, you know, expensive because it's a collector type item otherwise. All right, so this is the player that I bought next. It was manufactured in the middle of 99, but I bought it probably in early 2000 or so. And in hindsight, I didn't really need to buy this one. I was drawn in by its slightly smaller size. You can tell the whole thing is very circular. We're starting to get into like really late 90s, early 2000s kind of design aesthetic here. I also thought the enhanced shock protection, which Sony called G protection, would have been a major benefit. And another thing that I thought was neat is that the display is backlit. Well, Joke's on me in both regards. One, the shock protection, I'm sure it does work better, but I never ended up in a situation where I actually needed it. So the shock protection in my other player was just fine. And I kind of wasted money buying this player because it didn't really work any better. Um, and the backlit display, I didn't read the fine print. It only lights up if you plug the player into external power, whether that's like an external AC adapter or like a car lighter socket adapter. This, the screen doesn't light up when it's on battery. So yeah, I mean, it was a decent player and you can also see further evolution of the line with this player. We're starting to move with the display and the controls on the face instead of having the display on the front edge. All that's on the front edge now is just the headphone or rather the line out, the hold switch, the volume buttons moved from an analog dial to digital up down buttons. Obviously the tray open switch the headphone and, and remote connector, and then on the back, the DC input. The shock protection on this model, you can turn off, but what's interesting is Sony didn't think many people would need to do that because they hid the switch inside the player. So it's just a simple on off. There's no like adjusting the level of shock protection. On some players, you could increase or decrease the amount of shock protection, and that would have an impact on that whole lossy audio compression thing. If you decrease the amount of shock protection, it wouldn't need to compress the audio as much. With this one, it's just on or off. The other major thing specific to Sony is this is when they started switching to the CD Walkman branding and away from the Discman branding. Not sure why they made that change, maybe just to kind of unify the product line or because the term Walkman had more consumer response. I don't know. This was a good player, but I didn't, I didn't need to buy it. Here's another player from the same time period that I picked up relatively recently. And this just goes to show kind of the difference in product lines. This would have been a higher end player, probably selling for like 120, 130 bucks. 
And this would have been a lower end player selling for, again, 80 to 100. No shock protection on this one. Nothing really fancy, just digital mega base is really kind of its only, you know, major feature other than your typical ability to do like repeat and shuffle mode. But you can also see some of that evolution as well in that this one also has digital volume up down buttons. There's no remote control socket on the side. It's just a headphone jack. And what's also interesting is there's no line out jack on this one. It does offer DC input, but no proper line out. So you would just have to plug whatever you know you were feeding into the headphone jack and adjust the volume level appropriately. These days, again, something like this, 10 to 15 bucks on eBay, perhaps. Not a very big investment. And because this is late 90s, Sony was really kind of at the top of its game, along with other manufacturers, too, in terms of miniaturization and consolidation of components, which leads to better reliability. A player from the late 90s is going to be probably one of the most reliable players you can get simply because they hadn't gotten too far into cost cutting mode, but also the technology was so advanced and the players themselves really aren't as old yet, right? I mean, as I'm filming this, this player is 23 years old. It still works great, even though it's a little beat up. And finally, getting into players from the early 2000s. All of these have shock protection. They're from various years, from the early to mid 2000s or so. These again are also all Sony players, and they also kind of show different price points and, and capabilities. Again, with the Walkman branding also showing that interesting Walkman, like early 2000s Walkman logo, and it's kind of holographic, that looks neat. Sony was starting to get players into being a little bit more of a lifestyle type of product, right? Where they were inexpensive enough where some people may own more than one. Or maybe you want something in an interesting color, right? They stop just being made in black and silver. This one's this kind of purple type of color, and no doubt it came in other colors as well. But functionality-wise, this one was actually pretty basic. It's got just a regular headphone jack, no remote control support, but digital volume controls, built-in shock protection, bass boost, of course. It's it's what basic players became. Basically, this one just plays audio CDs, and that's it. It would have been a decent buy in the early 2000s. Again, probably around that $100 price point, but otherwise, not much to write home about. Here's what I'm talking about with thinness. You can see how this one is a decent bit thinner, although it's got this kind of bulge in the back. What's interesting about this player, there's no display on it. So this was a higher end player that was meant to be used with the remote control. So it would have included a remote control that had the display on that. Of course, you can use the player without the remote. It's got a full, you know, decent selection of buttons on the front for play, pause, skip, track, and volume and all that. And that's really kind of the bummer with these types of players today. Buying a used one is oftentimes those remotes got lost. So a player like this is still usable. You're kind of working it blind a little bit, um, you know, because there is no display otherwise if the remote doesn't come with it. But it's still going to be a decent player. What's also kind of neat about this one in particular is instead of hinging at the back, it hinges on the side. Um, but the reason for that bulge in the case is because it takes standard double A's. The battery compartment's on the inside, which is something that they kind of got to with these designs a little bit later, um, because the battery life started to become so good that you didn't need to frequently change them. Or they figured maybe you'd throw a rechargeable pack in there and then charge that battery up using the DC input jack on the side of the player. This would have been kind of a lower end option from the mid 2000s. It's got a display on it. All the controls are kind of around the front. So we're going back from having the controls and the screen on the top to having them on the front again. I don't, they, they just change style. Um, also multiple colors that you could get this thing in. G protection and mega bass. Um, this one just plays regular CDs. So, you know, another kind of decent basic player. You can find one of these likewise, 15, 20 bucks on eBay. The last category of players to talk about from this era are gonna be these. This was a high-end player in the early 2000s. I'd like to say this one's from 2001, 
And this was the very first MP3 capable device that I ever bought, like for portable audio. These had a very interesting niche because you could burn CDs with MP3 files on them and this player would play them back. And that was kind of the new frontier for portable CD players in the early 2000s. It was done entirely for cost. MP3 players otherwise, in that time period, they did exist, but they were expensive. You were looking at several hundred dollars for the player and they had a limited amount of built-in storage. Expandable storage, if the player offered it, was also very expensive, especially compared to the price of a single blank disc. So the sell on one of these types of players versus you know, a, a dedicated portable solid state MP3 player was that, well, yeah, you're paying 150 to 200 bucks for a player like this, but each blank CDR is what, 50 cents at the time? And 650 megabytes, 700 megabytes worth of MP3s was a lot more than what those dedicated MP3 players could store at that time. They were generally limited between, I don't know, 64 and 128 megabytes of storage, at least until the iPod came along with its built-in hard drive, you know, and, and creatives offerings and a few others that offered hard drives in their players. This was all about cost plus backward compatibility. So a lot of people bought players like this. These days, I'm not so sure that there's really much of a market specifically for MP3 playback capability, just because the price of a retro MP3 player is about the same cost as one of these nowadays. I mean, again, uh, 25, 30 bucks for something like this, you know, online, uh, eBay or, or Facebook Marketplace or whatever. Um, a comparable MP3 player, at least unless you want to start going down the iPod collecting rabbit hole, going to be about the same price these days. And this, of course, you've got the added step of needing to burn your files to a disc, whereas with those, it's just drag and drop. Back then, though, CD players that could play MP3s were definitely a real value add. We might as well also talk about players to avoid for one reason or another. First one is going to be these kind of oddity or specialty players, especially the vintage one. This is a Sony D88. I've also done a video all about this model. In a nutshell, its claim to fame is that it's a very compact player from the 80s that was capable of playing either mini CDs like CD singles or full size discs. The disc would stick out the side of the player, so that made it very not compatible with portability, but the fact that it was so small, you could hold it in your hand at the time compared to the bulk of like what a regular size player would be, gave it a bit of notoriety. These actually go for a lot of money these days, like literally hundreds of dollars. And unfortunately, because they were from the 80s, they're pretty old these days and going through some component failure. This player works, but the display is a bit wonky. And some of these just got absolutely trashed over the years. So that makes the good quality ones go up even more in price. If you want to get into collecting, one of these should definitely be on your list, but you've got to be a pretty diehard collector to want to drop the kind of money on a player like this otherwise. Another player to probably avoid for a few reasons is going to be the more boutique players from the 2000s. This is a Sony DEJ 1000. And at first glance, okay, yeah, it's a pretty basic player. And it's actually fairly high quality. This is a metal construction top and bottom. But look at how thin it is. This is what made this player stand apart. It's also one of those kind of players where they expected you to use the remote control. So there's no built-in screen on this one, just basic controls. If you want to turn on the repeat or shuffle functions, you can't do it directly from the player. You have to do that from the remote. And like we talked about, you know, a lot of times those remotes get lost from the unit. So finding a complete set becomes a bit more difficult. Also, these players are a little bit more prone to failure, not just because of the miniaturization, but also like as my note on here says, well, the thinness and smallness of them makes them a little bit more fragile. The latch on this battery compartment is broken off so it doesn't stay closed. And what's worse is this player actually suffered from a pretty bad battery leak 
but this doesn't even take normal batteries in order to achieve this thin profile Sony went with these so-called gumstick style rechargeable batteries. This thing takes two of them. They do still make new ones, third parties, but they're not that great a quality and they're a bit overpriced. Again, you'd need to be a pretty solid collector to want to get into a player like this and just all the other things you would have to do to maybe fix one of these up or get it working again, like buying new gumstick batteries for it or finding that remote control. Also, because it's a metal housing, it's gonna be more likely to get scuffed up and ding, so finding a good cosmetic one is gonna be a bit more difficult. In fact, a lot of these players, this one included, I ended up buying as a bulk lot, what they call a junk lot from Yahoo Auctions Japan. And for not a lot of money, I think I paid, oh geez, maybe 30 bucks or so for a dozen players. Um, they came in all different conditions. Some of them were in great shape. Some of them had some cosmetic stuff going on, like this one, right? Some scrapes on the top. Other ones were even rougher. Kind of like this one, showing even more scrapes on the top. Yet other ones were completely dead. They had horrible battery leakage. But I got 10 players for 30 bucks instead of like one player for 25. So if you have friends that maybe want to get in on this or acquaintances or you want to maybe turn repairing portable CD players into a little bit of a hobby, that's an idea. You could buy these bulk lots of portable players that may or may not work, test them out, fix up what's broken. A lot of times it's just cleaning them up and dealing with any battery leakage. In other cases, maybe multiple models of the same player are in a bundle and you can swap parts between the two of them in order to you know, get one working unit. But that can be another way to save some serious money and potentially even make you some money in the end. So obviously I've been showing you a lot of Sony players so far. Here's an example of a non-Sony one from my collection. This is a Panasonic SLS 270. I actually bought this one off of Yahoo Auctions Japan, and in the end, it probably cost me about the same as if I had bought an equivalent model from eBay in the US. This player, I think the end auction price was the equivalent of $5. <laughs> and then its share of the shipping over from Tokyo, which I bought a few other items along with it to help save on shipping. It was probably about 20 to 25 bucks for its share of shipping. So 30 bucks all in, we'll say. What's nice is it included the remote control, so you can get a good example of how that would have worked. This one is kind of the higher end remote where it's got the LCD on there to repeat what's shown on the main display, and you've got full control over the player. You know, track forward, back buttons, you can cycle through the various modes, your headphones plug into that socket on the end, and there's also a volume wheel here. The player itself is pretty basic otherwise. It does have shock protection, it does have bass boost, one thing that is kind of neat about this player, built in, it takes a pair of AA batteries like you'd expect, but there's this optional add-on battery pack that came with it. And you can stick another pair of AA's in there to double the runtime. If you don't want this add-on, you can take it off. This one, otherwise, solid player. A US spec model of this, like I said, probably go for 25, 30 bucks on eBay. This one sounds great as well. It works really well. So yes, Sony made some excellent players during the time period. And I don't think you can really go wrong with most of their players from the 90s and onwards, but don't overlook other high quality brands like Panasonic, Iowa, JVC, Kenwood, Technics, basically any of the big name Japanese brands from the 80s through the 2000s, I think you'd be in really good shape with. As for brands to avoid, well, other than the brand new no-name players that you can get that are going to be all over the place in terms of quality, which is why I really think going with a retro player is going to be your better bet. But even back then, there were some companies that made junk too. The ones to avoid from that time period are what I call the grocery store or supermarket brands. Um, brands like RCA, AudioVox, GPX, Craig. Uh, they were less expensive because they were built down to a price. They were 
all based on volume, just trying to sell units. It wasn't so much, we're gonna charge you a reasonable price for a reasonable quality player. It was more try to capitalize on an impulse purchase, or maybe you just didn't have much money. You were a kid and you were impatient. You had saved up a bunch of your allowance, but weren't quite to the point of being able to buy one of these nicer players yet. And your impatience got the better of you. And you're at the grocery store with your parents one day and you decided, screw it, I'm gonna buy this no-name thing. I would avoid those players because I just don't think they hold up to the test of time. And in a used market these days, there is practically no difference in price. Maybe a couple of bucks, but like I've said with all of these players, except for the really weird rare ones, you're gonna spend maybe 20 to 30 bucks for a portable CD player. And there are tons of these on eBay. I mean, even just within the Sony brand, tons of them on eBay. Even if this video were to go viral for some reason, I really don't think it's gonna have that big of an impact in the prices of these on the used market just because of the volume that's out there. These are an incredible value compared to the cheap brand new players. That does, however, lead to an interesting discussion about this format in general and sound quality and the differences between the players. CDs are going to be one of the most consistent formats that you can listen to. What I mean by that is all of the discs themselves are going to sound the same. So if they were mastered and manufactured in good quality, which the vast majority of commercially pressed CDs were, they're all going to sound the same. There's not so much worry about like with vinyl records is the, re the record itself worn out, right? Did someone wear out their record by playing it too much versus a brand new one that you know what I mean? CDs work or they don't. The other thing is the variation in sound quality from player to player is going to be so minimal. I mean, you'd have to be a really nitpicky audiophile, I think, to really notice the sound quality changing from one portable player to another. If you're listening with really, really high-end headphones, yeah, you might need a dedicated headphone amp or something like that because these were designed to be used with less expensive, kind of lower end, easier to drive headphones. But other than that, if you're trying to pick one of these up, just go for what seems to be most interesting to you. I wouldn't get too worried up about the specs unless you know you're going to be carrying the player around for some reason, in which case then you definitely want to get one that's got shock protection. Otherwise, do you go with a player from the mid 90s or the late 90s? Uh, as long as the seller says that it's working and it's a decent price to you, just go for it if you think it looks cool. You know, the best time to get into any sort of retro collecting is when it hasn't become trendy just yet, right? Right now, vinyl records and cassettes are trendy. CDs, I think, are starting to be on the upswing. And so now is really the best time to get into this format if you're interested. It's nowhere near as fussy as vinyl or cassette. There's a huge selection of them and brand new music continues to be pressed on this format. So it's not like you're stuck just listening to back catalog titles. CDs never really died. And so there's just a huge selection and used CDs. I mean, depending on where you go, anywhere between like a dollar and a few dollars each between garage sales, yard sales, used record stores, even online. The players themselves, even though good quality brand name portable players aren't being made anymore, there's just a ton of selection out there and they're still cheap. CDs still have a lot of life left in them, which actually kind of surprises me because it wasn't that long ago that I thought they would see the same kind of fate as vinyl and cassette, where they would be dead or dormant for a decade or two. But it looks like people are starting to uh, become curious about this format as well. Anyway, if you like this one, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.